The current conflict between Russia and Ukraine has its roots in centuries worth of history. That includes one of the most devastating famines that Europe has ever experienced. Keep watching for why that still matters in the context of today's struggle. The current Russia-Ukraine conflict revolves around the Minsk Protocols, which were signed in 2014 and 2015 to end the fighting in eastern Ukraine, where Russian separatists had declared a breakaway state called the Donetsk People's Republic. According to the protocols, both sides agreed to withdraw their forces and heavy weaponry from the front and allow humanitarian assistance, but it doesn't appear that the agreements have been successfully implemented. Ukraine's former finance minister Alexander Danny Liuk has accused Russia of taking advantage of the ceasefire to increase its troop numbers in the Donbas region, take control of regional governments, and bolster rebel forces. It's only up to us. Uh, to stop the Russian aggression. Russian President Vladimir Putin has refused to accept Russia's role as a party to the conflict. Russia has always denied the presence of any of its troops in Donbas, even though it has supplied the rebels with supplies and munitions. Thus, Putin has argued the Minsk protocols cannot apply to Russia. Since he claims that Russia has no soldiers to withdraw from Ukrainian territory, it is therefore not a combatant. Furthermore, according to Russia's claims, the Ukrainian army hasn't upheld its promise to stop the fighting, as clashes against separatists have continued despite promises for both sides to lay down their arms. It's important to understand Russian-Ukrainian relations from a historical perspective. Putin himself has contended that the inhabitants of both countries are one people that Western Europe and America have driven apart with a divide-and-conquer strategy. There is some historical truth to this perspective, as both nations trace their descent from the medieval Rus' state, which ruled over a vast swath of territory encompassing modern Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus before it split into warring principalities. Both countries revere Volodymyr, the patron saint of Ukraine, and the man who Christianized the Rus' people. When Orthodox Central Ukraine fell under Catholic Polish-Lithuanian rule, the Ukrainian Cossacks went to Moscow for protection. In fact, until the beginning of the 20th century, Ukrainians were called Rutinians, the Latin term for the inhabitants of Rus, and the root of the demonym Russian. But while Russia and Ukraine share a common history, Putin's argument has one major pitfall. Ukraine wasn't a unified state until 1991. Perhaps unsurprisingly, then, the country's different regions have significantly differing histories that have conditioned an array of attitudes towards Russia. While Putin's argument may resonate in Russian-dominated areas of Ukraine and perhaps among Orthodox Christians, it falls flat in Western Ukraine. This area has plenty of reasons to distrust Russia. Western Ukraine was formerly ruled by Austria and Poland, which left their mark on the region's culture. Although Ukraine is mostly Orthodox, Western Ukrainians adhere to Greek Catholicism, a symbol of Ukrainian nationalism that was ruthlessly liquidated under Soviet rule. The hostility toward Russia centers around the Soviet Holodomor genocide of 1933. This engineered famine killed between 3 and 10 million Ukrainians and Russified their lands with Russian colonists from other areas of the Soviet Union. Thus, Russian nationalism and Soviet atrocities are closely tied in modern Ukrainian attitudes. As noted by Business Insider in 2015, Russia's rejection of responsibility and Putin's past pro-Soviet statements only exacerbate this perspective. When you add to this mix the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, better known as NATO, you have a recipe for a major war. Ukraine has shown interest in joining NATO since 1992, a move that 54% of Ukrainians support, according to a 2021 public opinion survey. Membership would make Ukraine part of NATO's collective defense doctrine, forming a deterrent against future Russian encroachment. And more significantly, the United States and NATO would be able to deploy missiles there that would inevitably be aimed at Moscow. Should a war break out, the U.S. would be legally obligated to intervene against a fellow nuclear power. We are in a new reality, and all countries are going to have to step up for the, our collective defense needs within NATO, but then also to do what we can to support Ukraine. Russia has reportedly declared Ukraine's NATO membership the Red Line, although Putin has offered to back off from Ukraine should NATO withdraw its offer of membership. But accepting that assumes good faith from Russia, which is questionable considering other Eastern European states that have suffered under Soviet policies of Russification and communism. While the Russia-Ukraine conflict would inevitably involve NATO intervention, it's unclear how many Western European NATO states share Eastern Europe's opposition to Russia. Countries that are also members of the European Union must balance their NATO obligations with their dependence on Russian energy, as Russia reportedly provides about 35% of Western Europe's oil and gas supply. At the center of this conflict of interest is the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, a joint project between Russia and a consortium of European oil and gas companies. Since the pipeline can only be canceled if Russia's Gazprom energy company and all consortium members agree, they have every reason to lobby for a peaceful solution. But Russia ultimately holds all the cards, as multiple European countries rely almost exclusively on Russian gas. Thus, a Russian gas shutdown in the middle of winter during a war would have disastrous social consequences. 
As the conflict between Russia and Ukraine threatens to go global, observers have speculated about the attitude of another major power, China. Thus far, China has maintained an official position of neutrality, but official statements suggest that the Chinese Communist Party sees this as a chance to strengthen ties with Russia and isolate the U.S. How far will China go to stand with Russia as the conflict drags on? The American government has urged China to oppose any Russian expansion in Eastern Europe, while the Chinese government has reportedly asked all parties to remain calm and not escalate tensions any further. But Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi noted in a statement, Russia's reasonable security concerns should be taken seriously and resolved. China's position signals its willingness to tacitly support possible Russian moves in Eastern Europe in return for support on the international stage. China's international image has tarnished following revelations that it has thrown members of its religious minorities into concentration camps, on top of other human rights abuses. Vladimir Putin, however, has been a reliable pillar of support for Beijing. That doesn't bode well for the NATO alliance should war break out, as it would possibly bring two nuclear powers with expansionist interests into the American sphere of influence. Over the course of the conflict, the U.S. and Russia have traded accusations of warmongering, but Putin still faces political pressure from both pro- and anti-war factions in his own country regarding his decisions about Ukraine. For example, a letter from Russian academics accuses Putin's Russian corporate and media allies of pushing for war despite public opinion being against it. In the United States, meanwhile, the neoconservative movement has been the principal cheerleader of war. This lobby, which includes the powerful defense industry, has enriched itself tremendously from Middle Eastern regime change wars. Although the Biden administration has officially opposed war, Joe Biden himself has historically aligned with neoconservatives in support of America's Middle Eastern campaigns. Because of his past stances, populist Republicans and anti-war Democrats have been outspoken about their positions opposing war. Anti-war sentiment has reportedly united Americans across political lines in opposition to the Beltway war lobby. Leaders on both sides of the aisle are in agreement about not sending troops to Ukraine. According to the Pew Research Center, this is reflective of American public opinion, which is more concerned with ballooning national debt, economic inequality, immigration, and culture wars at home. People here in the U.S. are not only demanding an end to Russia's aggression, they are donating their time and money as the humanitarian crisis deepens. According to a 2021 YouGov poll, 73% of Americans oppose any war with Russia and instead want the government to focus on domestic issues. As Will Ruger, vice president of research and policy at the Charles Koch Institute, notes in light of the poll findings, after more than two decades of endless war abroad, it is not surprising there is wariness among the American people for yet another war that wouldn't make us safer or more prosperous. Although Ukrainians may not always consider Russia a brother country, many individual Russians have opposed war against Ukraine on this exact premise. Russia's anti-war movement doesn't seem to be as strong as it is in the U.S., but the sentiment is nevertheless present. According to a 2021 poll, at least 23% of Russians support Russian-Ukrainian friendship. Among Russians ages 18 to 24, which is the age group most likely to serve and die, sympathetic attitudes to Ukraine top 66%. This is a good marker of opposition to war. I'm afraid that something will happen here, and I'm afraid of people who live in Ukraine. You're afraid for them? Yes. Indicating some degree of hope, many Russians don't think war is even a prospect, as they reportedly either have faith that Putin will negotiate or at least cave to public opposition. Several people interviewed by the BBC in December 2021 referred to Ukrainians as brothers, suggesting that at least some segment of the Russian public has no interest in killing their fellow Eastern Europeans, with whom they share a history, religion, and culture. The Russian anti-war movement has reportedly not named particular warmongers, perhaps fearing a backlash from Putin or one of his allies. But an open letter from academics has accused the Russian media of stoking state-level tensions that don't exist between ordinary Russians and Ukrainians. While American and Russian attitudes to the conflict have dominated headlines, the often forgotten yet most important opinion is that of the Ukrainian people, who of course have the most to lose. Their voices fly in the face of the conventional wisdom that Ukrainian citizens want American intervention against Russia. According to Ukrainian academic Yuri Shelijenko, the Ukrainian people generally do not want war. There is simply no appetite for it, as around 40% of the population would refuse to fight or evade conscription. Shelijenko has accused the White House and American media of saber-rattling and provoking Russia. He suggests that Kyiv and Moscow should solve their problems bilaterally by strictly implementing the Minsk Protocols, that is, withdrawing all foreign forces from Ukrainian soil. Once tempers have cooled, negotiation can recommence. Shelijenko's proposal places Ukraine's oft-ignored interests at the center of the conflict, a position that has received support from Ukraine's Catholic establishment. 
The Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church is historically no friend of Russia thanks to the Soviet persecution of the 1940s. However, Sviatoslav Shevchuk, the major archbishop of the church, has refused to back the Ukrainian government, calling it a pawn in a U.S.-Russia conflict that Ukraine has nothing to gain from. Shevchuk doesn't appear to trust political processes, as he has instead appealed to Pope Francis to visit Ukraine immediately. Since even the Orthodox patriarchs of Russia and Ukraine respect the Pope's moral authority, Shevchuk believes that his presence will be enough to stop the war and get the parties back to the negotiating table. Yuri Shelijenko's perspective highlights a significant disconnect between politicians and the people. When politicians in general start wars, civilians and soldiers suffer and die. In Shelijenko's view, negotiation is the only way forward and always preferable to death, no matter how justified a war may seem. But that doesn't change the fact that Ukraine is at a geographic crossroads. Its position places it right in the firing line between Russia and the US, and it's unlikely that either side will want Ukraine in the other's sphere of influence. Fortunately, there is a potential solution that could work if all parties accept it. A piece published by the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft in January 2022 suggests that Ukraine should become a neutral country like Switzerland. The Donbass would return to Ukrainian control as a Russian-speaking autonomous region, and perhaps set a precedent to solve the problem of Crimea as well. Such an arrangement would preclude Ukrainian NATO membership, but would also guarantee its independence from Russia and shelter it from entangling alliances that have led to its current predicament. Currently, there is still a chance to make such an idea work. Putin has reportedly claimed that he will back off Ukraine if NATO blocks the country's entrance to the organization. If he is sincere in this regard, then this is a golden opportunity to spare Europe from another historically devastating war. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more videos about messed up history are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.